Well, again, just a, a word of welcome. It's good to see everybody that's gathered with us. And uh, we're going to look at the final section in Paul's uh, second chapter to the folks in the churches in Galatia. So we're going to be reading in Galatians uh, chapter 2, and we'll just read from verse 15 uh, down to the end of the chapter. And I hope uh, before our time runs out, uh, this afternoon that we'll be able to uh, finish these verses. So verse number 15, uh, Paul says, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And we know that the Lord will bless these words to our hearts this afternoon. Now, last Sunday, uh, we looked at the first 14 verses of Galatians chapter 2. If you weren't present last Sunday and you missed it, then you can find it on YouTube and you can go back and because uh, I really don't want to recap this afternoon. So if you're interested in what verses 1 to 14 are all about, then go onto YouTube and uh, it will, on that video, uh, after, uh, as I work my way down through these first 14 verses. But what we really have in verse number 15 is Paul really arguing the case for where he really stands as a believer in the Lord Jesus. He'll remind us of what he was, and then he'll remind us of what he came to an understanding of, and then he'll remind us of the step that he took, and he'll remind us of the blessings that he came into. Now, we've said right at the beginning when we started looking at Galatians that the big problem among the churches of Galatia were there was these individuals that had come among them, and they were teaching, hey, it's okay, you need Christ, and you need the cross, but, but... You need circumcision. You need the law. Uh, yes, you need the work of the Spirit, but you need to add something to the work of the Spirit. That Christ is not enough. The cross is not enough. That you need the law and you need, you need, you need self-effort in order to maintain your position before God. And so right through this, this, this letter, Paul is refuting that false teaching. And he's addressed it earlier uh, in a historical way and in a, a practical way. He's taken them away back to Acts chapter 15 because the problem that arose in Galatia wasn't a new problem. It had arisen in Antioch of Pisidia decades ago or years ago. And it is, it's simply rearing its ugly head once again. And Paul is writing to the Galatians and he says, listen, this issue has already been dealt with. We're, we're, why, are we, why are we digging up uh, old, old rubbish? It's already been dealt with and dealt with on the highest authority. It was dealt with in Jerusalem. And he says, all the apostles and all the leading men in Jerusalem came to a, an understanding and came to a decision. And he says the decision that was come to by the apostles in Jerusalem in Acts 15 is a decision that I have maintained and I have lived by. And yet in spite of that, in the spite of the blessing that Paul had experienced in his service as he preached the message of divine grace, salvation through Christ alone, by faith alone, then in spite of the blessing, churches being established here, there, and everywhere, there were still these teachers 
these professed Christians in Jerusalem that were trying to bring these new converts under the bondage of law. And Paul would have absolutely none of it, none of it. His gospel, God's gospel, is a gospel of grace. It's a gospel of grace, not of works. And Paul reminds us just at the end of the, the first section that we looked at last week that, that even Peter, who was party to the decision that was made in Acts chapter 15, and, and he was in absolute full agreement with it. And yet there was a time when, when he even succumbed to the pressure of these false teachers. And although he once ate with the Gentiles, he he then, in the presence of these false teachers, he withdrew from the Gentiles and would no longer eat with them. And Paul tells us in the previous verses that he would stood them to the face because he was to be blamed. He was to be condemned as the idea that he was marked by this timid spirit. He was afraid of this confrontation. He was afraid of the report that would be sent back to Jerusalem. He was afraid of losing his reputation or whatever. But because of fear, he had succumbed to the pressure that was put upon him by these false teachers. And Paul rebuked him. And Paul is continuing in that theme. And it's almost as if when we come to verse 15, it's almost a continuation of Paul's personal rebuke against Peter. Although somewhere along the line, he kind of slips into, into a very doctrinal and a very, a very uh, personal uh, part of the epistle. Uh, and so we'll notice in verse number 15 that he, 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 he says, uh, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. You know, he, he's telling us what, what they were, what they were what these false teachers were, what he was, what the other apostles were. We were Jews by nature. We had all the rights of, the, of a Jew. We had all the privileges of a Jew. We had the honor of being God's chosen people, the people to whom had been given the law and the prophets. We were Jews. We were Jews by nature. And of course, that was something that, 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 that Jews prided themselves in and still pride themselves in. This position that they have, this privileged position before God. And so he says in verse 15, we were Jews by nature. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. You, you, you know, the idea of being, uh, it's, it's the idea of being a heathen. We were not heathens like the, the Gentiles. We were not marked by the heinous sins that the Gentiles were marked with. Remember, it was said concerning the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 45 that the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. He was betrayed into the hands of the heathen Gentiles. And there seemed as if in the eyes of the Jews at least that there was no debt to what a Gentile sinner would not sink to. They were just marked by godlessness and marked by, marked by iniquity and sin. And he says, we weren't, we weren't part of that. We were, we were Jews by nature. We had all the privileges and all the rights of Judaism. And so he, he, he states his, what they were. Now, it's interesting that in this little section, he's, he's really addressing, he's addressing Jewish believers, uh, those who were Jews by nature, and yet they had come to personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. They were Christians. They've been saved by grace. And so Paul's saying, this is what we were. But in verse number 16, he says, but this is what we knew. This is what we came to a personal understanding of. This was the revelation that dawned in our minds, that dawned in our hearts, that we who were Gentiles by nature, knowing, knowing, what did they know? that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So somewhere along the road, Peter, and James, and John, and Paul, and many other Jews in Jerusalem and elsewhere, although they had all the privileges of a relationship with God through the law, they suddenly realized that the law was not enough. They suddenly realized there was a deficiency. 
Not so much in the law because the law was perfect, but there was a deficiency in them in being able to fulfill the law. And they came to an understanding. What Paul is doing in these verses is just right, he's just getting right to the heart of the gospel. He's getting right to the very heart of God's message for mankind to then and today. And he's going to show us it's, it's not law, it's grace. It's not what we can do. It's what Christ has done and what Christ is doing. And we see the contrast in these verses. From verse number 15 down to, to verse number 19. And comparing it with verse 20 and verse 21. What a contrast. And so it's no longer law. He says it's grace. It's no longer the law. The law. It's Christ. It's no longer works. It's faith. And Paul says, listen, we came to an understanding of that. We came to a knowledge of that. Each one of us in our own way, as led by the Holy Spirit, we know, we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law. The idea of being justified is the idea of being pronounced righteous, free from guilt, therefore free from punishment in the sight of God. The idea of justification is to have an acceptance before God, to be in a right place before God, to stand before him, not condemned in sin, but to stand before him justified, made righteous. And Paul says we came to know that that was not possible. It was impossible by the works of the law. You see, the only way that the law could justify a person was by complete obedience to it. That was the only means whereby the law could justify a man before God. It was if he fulfilled the law, if he kept the law in every single particle of it. And Paul says, listen, we knew it was impossible. We tried, we struggled, we attempted it for years. You know, Paul will tell us, and as he writes to the Philippians, he'll tell us how zealous he was as a Jew and how he sought to keep all the righteousness of the law. And he knew within his heart that he was failing, he was failing, he was failing. And seeking to keep the law as a means to merit favor and a right standing with God will always fail, always fail. And Paul says, we know that, we know that, each one of us who have professed faith in the Lord Jesus, who have turned away from Judaism, who have turned away from the law as a means of justification. You see, the law holds a man guilty. The law condemns a man. The law can never, ever justify a man. All the law does is show a man how wrong he is and how guilty he is before God. And Paul says we came to an understanding of that. That's how Paul talks as he writes to Timothy at the, uh, at the end of, of, of uh, his, his, his book to, to Timothy. You know, he'll say, you know, the reality is that, that God has shown, or the beginning of the book, he says, God has shown me mercy because that's what I needed. I, th I thought I was on the right track. I thought by keeping the law, then, then God would be favored, that, that God would look upon me favorably. But he says, I realized that I was... I was just a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was injurious. But he says, I obtained mercy. That's what I needed. That's what I needed. And friends, that's what every sinner needs. Every sinner needs mercy. Mercy from the hand of God, the mercy of God, and the grace of God. And Paul says, we, we got that revelation. And we should be thankful for having that revelation from God. And although the law would condemn they realized that there was, there was justification to be made right with God it was a possibility, but that possibility would not be on the grounds of the law. He says, it's by faith, it's by faith, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. He says, that's the means of being justified. Not the works of the flesh, but it's the faith of the Son of God. You know, the, the various translations translate that little phrase uh, in, in different ways. Uh, some would say faith in the Son of God. Some would translate it the faithfulness of the Son of God. 
And, you know, I would maybe kind of lean to that idea. Uh, and, and what Paul is really saying, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So it's not so much our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's his faithfulness. You remember what Paul says to the Romans about by one man's disobedience, sin entered the world. And then by the obedience of one, many are made righteous. So it's the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus. It's what Jesus did. You see, I'm not dependent on my faith. You know, we, we had a, a chap that used to stay with us in the rehab years ago, and, and he used to say, I've got faith in my faith. Well, I want to tell you, I don't have any faith in my faith. But I've got faith in the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus. That one who was obedient right on unto death, even the death of the cross. That one that fulfilled the mission that his father had sent him to do. That one that completed the work and cried, Tetelestii, it's finished. Faithful right unto death was he. And we rest. My justification, my place before God, my acceptance is based not so much even in my faith, but in his faithfulness. The faithfulness of the Lord Jesus as he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he's now, he's now sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. And so Paul says, this is what we were, and this is what we came to an understanding of, that there had to be another means. There had to be another means of justification because the law failed us. But where the law failed, praise God, the Lord Jesus succeeded. And he established a ground whereby God could be just and the justifier of all those that believe on the Lord Jesus, that rest on what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary. Notice what they did. It says, even we, even we, even we, we, we Jews. And you know, they, they weren't just, well, certainly as far as uh, Saul of Tarsus was concerned, he was no ordinary Jew. You know, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, touching the law. He was blameless. And no doubt there were others in the, the church at Jerusalem were of the same ilk as Paul was, Saul was. And he says, even we, even we, we came to this revelation and we came to understand that our justification was through Christ and what Christ accomplished on the cross at Calvary. And we believed in him. We believed in the Lord Jesus, and through that, we are justified. Through what he did, we are justified. They came to know that the law couldn't, but what the law couldn't do, praise God, Christ can do, and Christ did for them, and Christ does for us. But look at verse number 17, and I'm trying to rush through this wee bit because verse 20 is my favorite verse in the Bible, and I, I want to try to get to verse 20 and spend a wee bit of time there. But verse number 17, we see of what they were accused of. I think Paul's really talking kind of sarcastically in verse number 17. Uh, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is there for Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. You, you know, we know, we know that there was kind of charges were getting laid against Paul because of this teaching that, that justification was through Christ, that it was all Christ. It was Christ and Christ alone. And there were, Paul was being condemned and, 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 and they were saying that his, his message was insufficient. It was incomplete, that there needed to be the law. There needed to be the law. So they were really saying that, that Paul and those that taught the same message of grace that he taught, that they, that they were in error that they were sinners, that they had actually sinned in departing, as it were, from dependence on the law to dependence on Christ, that they were in error, that they were in transgression. And Paul is really saying, listen, are you saying that Christ is, is a minister of sin? Are you really saying that the, the, the end result of us depending on what Christ did as opposed to depending on what we have done that that really means that, 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 that we are sinners instead of the fact that we have come into the forgiveness of sins and that there's no condemnation, but there's no just. Is that sin? Is Christ the minister? Does Christ impart sin to those that trust in him? Is that what you're saying? And that is the logical, uh, that's the logical outcome of what they were saying. 
They were really accusing uh, Paul and, and, and those, his companions, and those that were insisting on grace alone. They were saying, no, you guys are in error. You're in serious error. It's incomplete. It's insufficient. You need the law. You need the works. You need the circumcision. And of course, Paul goes on in verse number uh, 18, and it, it reminds us of what some of these folks were doing. He says, he says, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. You know, he takes that on himself, but he's really having a hit at these false teachers because that's what they were doing. If I through the law, uh, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. He says, I'm not a sinner because I have put my faith in the Lord Jesus and all that he has done on the cross on my account. I'm not a sinner because I have done that. He says, but you're sinners, you're transgressors, and that you have professed to believe in Jesus, and that you seek to, you seek to build up the thing that you claim to have turned away from. You claim to have seen the insufficiency of the law. And the insufficiency of the law drove you to faith in the Lord Jesus. And yet having come to faith, you're turning again to the thing that you thought was insufficient for your salvation. He says, you're the transgressors. You're the transgressors. You're the guys that are not only sinning, transgressing, but you're causing others to transgress, to sin as well. And so Paul is quite clear that the law can never justify uh, the law is righteous, the law is God-given, the law is holy, but the law as a means of justification fails, not because of any fault in the law, but in well, a fault in those that are under the law, a fault in the heart of every man. And so Paul is saying, listen, sin is seen, not in leaving the law for Christ, but in going back from Christ to the law. Verse 19, he says what they've become. Uh, he says, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. You know, this whole idea of being dead and alive, we'll see it again in the next verse and we'll see that right through Paul's, uh, Paul's writings. Uh, you know, it's interesting just to, uh, I better not transgress here, but but just even to think about the great subject of death and the subject of life, and just see the various aspects of death and the various aspects of life that we find in the, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, but we'll just need to leave that there. Uh, but he says, listen, he says, he says, through the law, he says, I am dead to the law. But he says, that's really what the law did for me. That was the extent of what the law could accomplish in my life. It could just show me, it could just show me that I was dead. It, it, it just condemned me. It just brought the sentence of death across me, across my life. And he says, although through the law I am dead to the law, it is in order that I might live unto Christ, that I would see this new system of things, this new basis of things that God has introduced in the gospel, that we can be alive to him, alive to him through the Lord Jesus. And that's the subject of verse number 20 of our chapter this afternoon. Let's just read it again because this is the heart, this is the heart of the gospel. This is what Christianity is all about. You know, you young folks are here and young folks online. Go home and read Galatians 2 and 20. And read it again, read it again, and read it again, and read it again, and read it again, and read it again. And pray for the revelation of God. Pray that God would impress the truth that's in this verse into the very depths of your being that you might be changed by it, changed by it. You know, this is, this is, not, this is not just doctrinal, it is doctrinal, but this is, this is practical. This is at the very heart of, of practical Christian living. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God or the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What we have in these verses, or that verse, is, is two important things. Number one, the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus. That's what we've got at the end of the chapter, the end of the verse. But we've not only got the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus, 
We've got the substitution of the life of the Lord Jesus. And that's the beginning of the chapter. The substitutionary death of Christ. And the substitutionary life of Christ. And the truth of the gospel is this. Not only did Jesus Christ give his life for us in death at Calvary. But that Jesus Christ gives his life to us. Practically, moment by moment, day by day, as we live in this world. Can I repeat that? Christ not only gave his life for us at the cross, but Christ gives his life to us day by day in order that we might live lives that are alive unto God, as he says in verse 19. Christ was our substitute. He took our place in death. Christ is our representative. He lives his life in us. Brothers and sisters, young folks, get a grasp of these things. Absolutely fundamental, absolutely practical for our Christian lives. I suppose as we think of the end of the, end of the verse and uh, we think of uh, the Son of God loving us and giving himself for us, the cross, the cross at the very heart of the gospel. You know, I suppose there's a sense in which God faced the problem. God faced the problem. On the one hand, he couldn't overlook the sin of mankind. He, he couldn't overlook the fact that the law simply condemned men and passed the sentence of death upon them. He couldn't overlook that. He couldn't just pretend that that wasn't true. And God cannot, God cannot forgive simply on the basis of men saying, I'm sorry for my sins. God cannot forgive simply on the basis of man's repentance. God must have a just basis to forgive. God must have a just basis to justify men. Because God is, God is holy. God is holy. God cannot alter his position. God cannot change his disposition towards sin. He is a holy God. He hates sin. He abhors sin. He must deal with sin. Sin must be judged because he's holy. But not only is God a holy God that demands the judgment of sin, but he's a loving God and he longs for the forgiveness and the justification of the sinner. And that's the divine dilemma, as it were. The holiness of God and the love of God. How can he justify without, without compromising his holiness? How can he judge without compromising his love? And that's where the cross comes in. That's where Calvary comes in. The sacrifice of Jesus is the answer to the divine dilemma. So that God can remain just and yet he can justify the ungodly. He can justify you and me. First John chapter 4 and verse 10 says, Here in his love, here's the heart of God. Not that we love God, but that he loves us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The greatest display of love is at the cross at Calvary. God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. For us. The problem God faced, He's holy and yet He's loving, longs to forgive the sinner, and yet His justice demands that the sinner's sin be punished. Not only have we got the problem that God faced, but in this verse we've got the person that God sent. The person that God sent. And Paul talks about him, he refers to him as the Son of God. He talks in the opening part of, the chapter, of verse 20, he talks about Christ. And then he talks about the Son of God. The Son of God. God sent his Son. God sent his Son. Why? 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 Why his Son? Why Christ? Why the Messiah, the Anointed One? Why the darling of his bosom? Why? Because there was none other. There was none other. The hymn writer says there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. There was no other. 
And the reason there was no other was because that he was the only one, the only man that has ever lived that was untainted by sin. You see, if someone is going to take the place of someone else under the condemnation of God, then that person themselves must be blameless. He must be, he must be in a place where he is, he's unchargeable by any offense. He cannot bear the sin of another if he's bearing sin on his own body in his own life. He must be a man in all his glorious perfection, all his sinless moral beauty. If one is going to die for another, to bear the punishment that another deserves, then he himself must be absolutely inherently righteous as well as practically righteous. How can a man lay down his life for another if he's due because of his own sin to die? The Lord Jesus Christ was the only one who had an unforfeited life. We have forfeited our life because of our sin, because of our rebellion, because we have failed to keep the law of God, the holy standard of God. We've come short of his glory, and therefore our lives have been forfeited. And the condemnation of death rightly and justly is upon us. Christ was the only one who had an unforfeited life. Death had no claim on him because he was without spot and without blemish. And he was the only one, therefore, who was the fit individual to be the substitute for sinners like you and me. He alone, he alone could do what he liked with his life. He alone. He alone had the right to lay it down and to take it up again. No other man, this twice over in this very book, as well as in other letters, Paul refers to that little expression, gave himself. Chapter 1 and verse 4, he gave himself for our sins. Here in verse 20, uh, that he gave himself, he gave himself for me. Nobody else can give themselves in that, in that sense. That Christ alone had the right and the authority to lay down his life in death because death itself had no claim upon him. And so we've got the uh, problem God faced, the person God sent, we've got the price that he paid, the price that he paid. You see, it wasn't enough for Christ just to come. It was absolutely vitally important that Christ die, that Christ die. You know, the incarnation is wonderful. The incarnation brought Christ uh, brought God, uh, the incarnation of Christ brought God to men. But it was only the death of Christ, it was only the crucifixion of Christ that would bring men to God, bring men to God. The cross was absolutely vitally important. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for us all. He's the one that stands in the breach. He's the one that does what the law can never do. The law condemns us. Praise God. Our mediator, the Lord Jesus, gave himself on the cross in order that we might be reconciled to God. The one mediator. The law failed in its mediatorship. But praise God, there's one that never fails. And that one, because of the, the ransom price that he paid, is able to reconcile men to God. And there at the cross, the demands of God's holy judgment was met. It was met in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's holy wrath poured out on his own holy son. The son of God stood in the breach between sinners and a holy God and bore the full force of divine wrath against sin. He became, praise God, he became my substitute. He gave himself for me. You know, Paul, Paul goes back to that thought time and again, doesn't he? It's almost as if he can't get away with it. He can't repeat it enough. Can't get away from it. He can't repeat it enough. He emphasizes it in so many of his letters. Speaks about the death of Christ and it's for us. It's on behalf of us. It's for the sake of us. It's in the place of us. It's instead of us. 
Romans 5 and 8, Romans 4, 25, Romans 5, 6, Romans 8, 32, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and we go on and on and on and on. The value, the value, the eternal value of the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross at Calvary. What happened at Calvary? Oh, you know, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 22, 21, he says, him who knew no sin, the Lord Jesus, was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's an exchange that takes place, and he takes all our sin, the sin that deserved, the sin that condemned us, the serve, the sin that sentenced us to die, the sin, the sin that we deserve the punishment for. He took all that sin, and he imparts to us his righteousness. What an exchange. What an exchange. It's a gift. <laughs> you know, that, that, you know this cuts across what these false teachers were saying and what they're saying today out there in the world. You know, that salvation is not by works. It's by grace. It's through faith. It's a gift of God. The work has been done. The price has been paid. The substitute has died in her place. The punishment that sinners deserved has been absorbed by the Lord Jesus. All we like sheep, says the prophet. We have gone astray. We have turned everyone to their own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And God himself in Christ met the claims of his own holy law against sin. And so the sinner can say this afternoon, upon a life I did not live. Upon a death, I did not die. Another's life, another's death, I rest my whole eternity. My sin, or oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. Another hymn writer says, On him, almighty vengeance fell, which would have sunk a world to hell. He bore it for a chosen race, and thus became our hiding place. What a contrast. What a contrast to the false teaching of these Judaizers from Jerusalem that were saying, listen, you need the law, you need works. You need circumcision, you need to do, you need the feast, you need all the rituals. No, you don't. Paul says it's all been done. All oh, that's a failure. Never justified. He says, but the work of Christ is absolutely perfect and absolutely complete. What was the personal motivation for all that took place at Calvary? Paul says it was love. It was love. It was love. The holiness of God is seen in the dark hours on the cross when he abandoned his own son and poured out upon him his wrath against sin. The holiness of God, but oh, the love of God. And that's what grips Paul's heart, isn't it? He says, the son of God loved. The son of God loved me, me. Brothers and sisters, you know, that's, that's enough to... That's enough to cause us to rejoice, surely. God values us. God values us. You know, we're living in days when people are just marked by so low self-esteem and low self-worth. People get to the end of the road and feel that life's not worth living because life is no valued and they, they just decide to opt, opt out and end it all. Listen, friends, Every one of us is valuable, valuable, so valuable. And God was prepared to send his son to die for us, and Christ was prepared to bear the judgment for our sins on the cross because he loves us, he loves us, he loves us. Spurgeon says the distinguishing mark of a Christian is his confidence in the love of Christ and the yielding of his affections, our affections to him in response. Christianity is about a love relationship. It's not about a law relationship. It's about a love relationship. It's having a love relationship with Jesus Christ, enjoying his love and expressing our love, our love 
to him. You know, Paul doesn't he just say that the Son of God loved, he says, the Son of God loved me. Love me. A murderer. A blasphemer. And yet he was loved. And all the sins of Saul of Tarsus were all laid on Christ. And Christ bore them away at the cross. And Paul rejoices in that. And that heinous sinner, though he be no better, no better than any Gentile was he. And the law proved that to Paul. And he knew that in his heart, that he was no better than the heathen Gentiles. That he was just the same with all his privilege. And it took the death of Christ not only to save Gentile sinners, but it took the, great, the death of Christ to save religious Jewish sinners as well. And all men need saved. And salvation alone is in the person of the Lord Jesus. And salvation is based, well, it's, it's, it's motivated by the, the love and the heart of God for sinners. And Paul says he loved me. Personal, real, sacrificial love. For me. And Paul's talking here as if he was the sole object of divine affection, as if he was the sole recipient of divine grace. If it's, if it's, as if he alone was in the enjoyment of salvation. He says, It's me, it's for me, it's for me, it's personal. Someone has said, No matter who else was loved, you love me. No matter from whom, for who else, he gave himself. He gave himself for me. He gave himself for me. Oh, to rest in that. Oh, to enjoy that this afternoon, that we're loved by him and that he died for us. What's the practical implications of all that then? That's really where, that's really where we get to at the beginning of verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Remember he said in the previous verse, verse 19, that, that, that I am dead to the, uh, that through the law I am dead to the law. And now he says, I am crucified with Christ. You see, there's a great difference between realizing and understanding that on the cross, Christ was crucified for us. And realizing that on the cross, that we were crucified with him. The one brings us deliverance from sin's condemnation. Christ was crucified for us. The other brings us deliverance from sin's power. That we are crucified with him. And brothers and sisters, that's the completeness of the salvation that God offers us. It's a salvation not only from the consequences of our sins, the punishment of our sins. That's been born for us by Christ at Calvary. But it's a salvation that gives us power over sin. It defeats the power of sin. It overcomes the power of sin in our life. And how does it do it? It does it in exactly the same way. Through death. I am crucified with Christ. Co-crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was crucified for sin. And we are crucified to sin in Christ. The one puts away that which we have done and the other puts away what we are. The one is the crucifixion of sin. The other is the crucifixion of that where, of where sin dwells. It dwells in self. It dwells in our flesh. The one is the death of what I, asked, I, I was. The other is the death of what I am. And so the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was a substitutionary death. And yet there's a sense in which not only did he die for us, but, but he died, that we died in him. We have been crucified in him, in union with him. You see, that's really what Paul, and I'm watching my time, that's really what Paul was, was talking about in Romans chapter 6. Uh, go back and read Romans 6 and verse 3 to 7, particularly those who are listening to this message and are not yet baptised. Uh, you maybe wonder, well, why do we need to be baptized? What's baptism really all about? What does it mean? Well, I don't have time to take you down through Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 7, but you read it for yourself, and the Lord will tell you what it means. 
And, and what it's really based on is the fact that, 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 that we are we are one with the Lord Jesus, that those who come to the Lord Jesus and, and believe in what Jesus did on the cross on our behalf, that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, the outcome of that is that we are united with the Lord Jesus. We are one with him, so that all that happened to Jesus Christ on the cross really happened to us that he died and we died in him. He was buried and we were buried in him. He was rose and we are, we are we are rose and we are alive in him. It's this association, it's this identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he, here's a sheet from my notes. Now I can take this sheet and I can fold it up and I can put it in this hymn book. Now that sheet of paper is now one with that hymn book. I put this hymn, hymn book back on the pulpit and the piece of paper is back in the pulpit. I can take this book and I can sit it in the chair to my side me and my piece of paper is sitting in the chair beside me. I could take this hymn book and I could throw it in a fire and I could burn the hymn book and then burning the hymn book, I burn the piece of paper in it because it's one with it. Brothers and sisters, I am one with the Lord Jesus. So all that happened to Jesus happened to me because I'm in him. I died in him. I was buried in him. I've been raised in him. In association, in identification with the Lord Jesus. And that's what Paul's saying. I've been crucified with Christ. The tense that he uses is the past tense. And it's the idea that the nuance of the tense is the fact that it's something that has happened to him by someone else. So it's not something that he has done. He hasn't crucified himself, but he's been crucified by virtue of his union, his identification with the Lord Jesus. It's past, it's final, it's once and for all. It's happened by another's actions. And Paul says, I am crucified. That means he's delivered from the law. That's what he's talking about earlier on. The law has no more to do with him and he has no more to do with the law as far as justification is concerned. He's experienced freedom from the law. Why? Because he's died. He's been crucified. The penalty of the law has been carried out. Therefore, he is free and free to live a holy, effectual Christian life, not on the basis of law keeping, but on the basis of the life that he receives in the Lord Jesus, because he says, I am crucified with Christ. He says, nevertheless, I live. But it's no longer I who live, it's Christ that lives in me. There's the power that's available for Christian living. The power of Christ's resurrection, point number one. And the power of Christ's residency, point number two. The resurrection of Christ out from the dead, and the residency of Christ in the heart of every genuine, blood-bought, born-again child of God. The power of resurrection and the power of residency is that which enables us to live successful, vital Christian life. Nevertheless, I live, says Paul, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Notice the difference in the, t in the tenses in, in the first part of the verse. Uh, we've mentioned that, that I am crucified with Christ. That's the past. That's a once for all, never to be repeated act. But then he says, nevertheless, I live. That is a continuous present. This is something that is ongoing, that Christ lives. Christ lives in me. You know, the Christian life is really the exchange life. Uh, not just the exchange life. The Christian life should be a change life. You know, when a person professes to be, a, to be saved, to be a Christian, there should be a change in their life. But the reason there's a change in our life is because there's been an exchange in our life. It's the exchanging of our life for his life. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, seemed to be a bit of a character before he got saved, very immoral. And uh, he got saved, radically changed by the power of God, the power of God's grace. And he was going down the street one day in a, a rather kind of seedy area of the city that he used to frequent for sinful, sinful behavior. And one of his old acquaintances saw him 
And she shouted, Augustine, it is I, it is I. And he looked at her and suddenly it floods back into his mind all the dalliances that he'd had with her in the past. And he looked at her and fled from her presence. And he said this, but it's not I. It's not I. It's not I. You see, that old Augustine was gone. That old Augustine had been co-crucified with the Lord Jesus. And it was a new I. It was Christ that was living in him. And that's where Paul is. Christ is now the source of his life. He derives all his energy, all his zeal, all his life from vital union with the Lord Jesus. And Christ and Paul were so close together that they lived in each other. He was in Christ and Christ was in him. Brothers and sisters, that's awesome, mind-blowing truth to grasp this afternoon. That right now, I am where Christ is, seated in the heavenlies, and right now, Christ is where I am, dwelling, dwelling within my heart. Christianity is not a matter of legalism. It's a matter of life. Christ not only gives his life, but he is the life that he gives. I am not, he not only gives life, but he is the life that he gives. The Christian can say, not only the fact I am alive, but the fact that Christ is alive in me. Brothers and sisters, that's not just imitation. That's not just us trying hard to be like Jesus. Trying hard to be a good Christian. Trying hard to kind of manifest Christian virtues. It's not, it's not imitation, it's incarnation. It's Christ incarnate, Christ dwelling, Christ fleshed out in these bodies of yours and mine. Christ didn't die for us that we might go on living our life as we choose. But he died for us in order that he might live his life in us. He has a claim upon us. And our bodies are now temple bodies. Bodies for Christ to dwell in and Christ to live his life. And that is the power that's available for you and I. You know, someone has said, you know, when I try, that's what most of us do. That's how most of us spend our Christian living, trying Trying, trying. When I try, I fail. But when I trust the indwelling Christ, he succeeds. Christ manifest in me. Christ magnified in me. Christ living in me. You know, stories told of a guy who bought a new Cadillac, top of the range. And, you know, he was really pleased with his car. And, you know, a few weeks later, somebody sees him pushing it along the road. And he says, why are you pushing your car? He says, why would I not push it? But guys, you're not supposed to push it. He says, all the powers within the engine and the fuel in the engine. He says, you just need to sit in the driver's seat and turn on the ignition. So many of us have got this beautiful new car. We've got Christianity. It's a wonderful thing. And we're trying to push our way through life. It's not a case of pushing. It's a case of starting up the engine and yielding to the power that's in the engine within us. You know, the best illustration I've got, and I'll, I'll need to close, uh, I think it was actually Corey Ten Boom that maybe first came away with this. Uh, it was the illustration of the glove. You know, th this, this glove just looks like a hand. You know, it's got a thumb and it's got four fingers and it's got a palm and it's just, it's just like a hand. But the fact is that you can do nothing with this glove. This glove has got no power. It's got no life in itself. I couldn't tell this, uh, this glove to pick up my Bible. It's impossible. It's impossible. But, you know, when I take my hand and I slip my hand into the glove, suddenly the glove can do what the hand can do. And I can lift up this hymn book and I can hold it and I can turn the pages. Suddenly the, uh, suddenly the, the, the glove can do what the hand can do. And yet the glove has no in power, inherent power. It's just a glove. And brothers and sisters, that's just really what our lives are like. We're just like, we're just like gloves. We've got no inherent power. There's nothing we can do of ourselves. Without Christ, we can do nothing. But in Christ and through Christ, we can do all things. And we just need to yield. We just need to let Christ, as it were, live his life in me. You know, 
sometimes I've used this illustration a number of times in the past, and you know, sometimes I use another glove, just a, a plastic glove, a, a, a rubber glove, because I wouldn't like to do a brain operation, neurosurgery with gloves like that. Every neurosurgeon wears gloves, but no gloves like that because there's too much glove. There's too much glove. And so there's things that this glove can do, but there's, there's things that it can't do because it's too much of it. And when a neurosurgeon is doing these intricate brain operations, his, his gloves are literally, you can hardly know where the glove starts and the, and the, the hand starts and, the, and the, 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 the hand stops and the glove starts. They're almost one with the glove. The hand and the glove are one and they're able to perform mighty things. And you know, the reason that we oftentimes are still kind of uh, stagnant in our Christian lives and still uh, marred by so much failure is because there's still too much of us. Still too much of us. And too little of Christ being expressed in us. I don't have time to dwell on that anymore. But, but you know, the Christian life is, is Christ's life in us. I want, to, I want to stress that. Christian is Christ, I am. Christ and I am nothing. See, it's all Christ. It's not us trying to be like Christ. It's not us trying to accomplish what Christ accomplished. It's allowing Christ to be himself in us and to work his life in us. You know, it's all about Christ at the very heart of it. He must be the source. He must be the vital energy. But then he talks about the principle that he lives with, the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself by me. That's the principle. It's the principle of faith. It's in the sphere of faith. Paul says, I live right now by a practical, ongoing faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself by me. Not only are we justified by faith, but we live by faith. This means that saving faith cannot be reduced to a one-time decision or event in the past, but it's a living, dynamic reality permeating every aspect of the believer's life. Justified by faith, they just live by faith. It's the principle upon which we operate. And then Paul says in verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. What is it all about? You know, what was Galatians 2 and 20 all about? If it's possible to be justified by keeping the law. He says it's just absolutely vain. It's absolutely pointless. That Christ would have died for no reason if he alone is the means whereby individuals, Jew and Gentile, can be reconciled and can be justified before a holy God. Let's pray.